Jenna Kutcher, I am so excited that we get to have you sit under you, hold on to the wisdom that you're going to deposit into our lives. But thank you for saying yes to being on. We're going there. What a privilege it is to have you and to host you. Oh, I'm so excited to dive in today. Okay. So I'm excited because when I looked at your life and I followed the journey, whether through like motherhood or your life, your life choices, you're moving from Maui to Minnesota. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that kind of look at your life and say, wow, this woman has it all together. I loved how we got to unpack uh, grit and resilience from so many different angles that we're going to follow that in here today. And so, you know, my twin sister, Jasmine, yes. and you guys talk all things uh, business. And yes. now you're talking to me, which is all things Bible. So we have a Jenna sandwich today I on the love podcast. This. You know, it's crazy because when I talk to each of you, there's so much similarity, but I know the topics will be different. So <laughs> I'm ready to roll with you, Bianca. You take me where you want to go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So, um, that you are so multifaceted and, um, I'm really big on this kick right now of discovering integrated li living and but specifically integrated wholeness, how yeah. one area of our life can impact so many others. And so I want to, I'll, I'll lead with the end in mind. I want to talk about the professional aspect of your life, the personal aspect of your life and the physical aspect of your life. And the reason why I kind of want to start here is because we can see an online life. Yeah. And all the adages that are out there, you know, it's, you know, when we see things online, it's only a snippet of our lives or it's the highlight reel versus what's on the cutting room floor. We don't see the pain. We only see the pretty and the glossy. And so before we dive into the podcast, I kind of want to get listeners who know you and those that will know you more after the end of this episode. But I kind of want to, when we talk about new beginnings, you have been in this metamorphosis over the last decade of your life from entrepreneur or from a corporate world to entrepreneur, from non-mother to a mother, moving to Minnesota to Maui. I mean, so much of your life has been just absolutely insane. And so before we dive into some of the practicals of how, how do you have new beginnings? Where do you start? How do you begin? What I want us to kind of have a conversation with whatever you feel comfortable with, what in your life that you have been processing in your now feels new? What's something that maybe you haven't been that public with, but you feel comfortable sharing? Because I want people to know that as vulnerable and as real as you are getting, that's the place that I want people to go. Because I don't believe that we will have a new unless yeah. we identify what we're currently in. So what's something that you're thinking about wrestling through or processing in this season of your life? Yeah. So this one's a new one for me, even me, is I am 35 years old and I was recently diagnosed with ADHD. And it was crazy because I didn't even know that was a thing. I just thought everyone's brains ran in a million directions at the same time. And um, motherhood was really the mirror that I needed to really start to recognize, like, I am wired a little bit differently. And that has been a gift, but it can also present a lot of challenges. And so behind the scenes, really paying attention to how my brain works, how to support it, how to let it rest... Um, and how to lead through that, because I think that actually a lot of women are undiagnosed ADHDers and a lot of times we don't even think about it or see it until we have someone little in our lives, if we're blessed in that way. And, uh, for me, it was really watching my kids and being like, okay, wait, they're getting these things from me and I want them to love themselves. And like, how do I love myself through this? And what does this look like? Okay. Out of curiosity, because yeah. my husband has told me a number of times that yeah. I, I, that I'm ADHD, but I just thought it was kind of like a joke or like, so what made you go on? The, how did you realize this? And then how did you get diagnosed? So I had a guest on my podcast who was an ADHD expert and I just thought it was a fascinating topic. I had no lens that I thought that I needed the topic. And after the interview, she said, you know why I wanted to come on the show, right? And I said, no. And she goes, you 100% have ADHD. And I was like, wait, what? And she's like, I have listened to your show for years. And the things that you have to do in order to be productive and the ways that you struggle, 1,000% point towards ADHD. I really think you should get a diagnosis. I had no idea. Bianca, I had just done the interview just thinking this is fascinating, <laughs> not thinking this is me until she said that. And then I brought it to my family and my mom goes, oh yeah, your dad totally has it. And <laughs> it is genetic. And no one in my entire life had said anything. And so it literally sent my entire family into this snowball effect of like learning about our brains and doing wow. like an analysis on it. Isn't it wild? 
This is a wild. Yeah. Can I just can I just affirm you for your vulnerability? Like you didn't have to tell us this, but this is like this is where we're starting. And yes. I feel like this is a new journey for you that you're out working and like a girl, I gotta bring you back and we can just have a whole other conversation about ADHD and because I'm I'm about to call, excuse me, Dr. Hakeem, we need yeah. to set up an appointment because I need to take test for ADHD. That's Truly. so funny. That's so funny. I, I think my dad has it as well. And if it is genetic, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I got I have to give people practical handles on how to have a metamorphosis in your life, but I'm wildly fascinated with how like you've discovered this at this yes. season of your life. Yes. Okay. So uh, I want to dive into a little bit of the professional aspect. So you went from like the corporate world to entrepreneur and there are people that listen to this podcast in different ages and stages. But one of the things that I do know uh, about our podcast listeners is that they're hungry for transformation. Yeah. They really want to change. And so I love bringing like the practical and the how. So I believe that there's people that are listening to this podcast that are either entering a season where they're might, might questioning, are they released from a job or mm -hmm. has a season ended at a job um, is, or maybe Maybe they're moving out of their location and they just have a new job. So walk us through your lens and filter uh, when knowing professionally that you had to start anew, that there was something new that allowed you, or excuse me, that there was a desire inside of you to leave the corporate world to start something new. So one thing that I think is so interesting about my path, and I think that so many of your listeners are going to relate to this, is a lot of times I didn't know what I wanted. I just knew what I no longer wanted. And I feel like when we see these like beautiful quotes on the wall of like, chase your dreams and you'll never work a day in your life or things like that. There are so many women listening that they're like, I don't even know what my dream is. I don't even know mm -hmm. how to dream anymore. Like, who am I? Right. And when I look at my journey, it was never fueled by like, I want to become a photographer. I want to become a podcaster. I want to become an author. It was all fueled by like, Oh, this doesn't feel right anymore. Or this doesn't serve me anymore. I want to move away from this without abandoning what got me here today. And so mm. when I look at the evolution of my career over the last decade, I have worn so many different hats. My career has gone in so many different directions. I don't even know how to introduce myself any longer, but that is really the evolution and the pursuit of saying, does this feel right? Does this feel good? Does this feel successful? And if the answer is no to any of those things, how do I start to move away from what isn't working and move towards something else? And so for yeah. anyone that's listening and you're like, I'm on the precipice, but I don't even know what I'm moving towards. Maybe it's time to take an analysis of what you want to move away from. Ooh, okay. Without even knowing where we're going, honey, this just sets us up. <laughs> Because in order to enter into the new, we can't take with us the old. Yeah. So in your journey, um, I know this feels old to you, but I know that there's people who are, are, won't maybe necessarily know this information or know this yeah. aspect about you. But when you were transitioning out from corporate into photography, into podcasting, into writing, like all of this stuff, like what was, you use this phrase, this yeah. doesn't serve me. Yeah. So what were the things of the old that didn't serve you? Cause I yeah. think that people are going to find freedom and, and you articulating. Sometimes you said something that was really fascinating. You yeah. said it was a feeling yeah. and then you realized it didn't serve you. So sometimes we, we don't trust our feelings because yeah. people say, Oh, don't trust your feelings, but your feelings could lead you to an understanding. So put language around what, yes. what were you leaving in the old as you yes. stepped into the new? I'll tell you every stepping stone. So corporate world. I was leaving behind someone else planning my life for me. So when my boss sat me down and said, here is your five-year plan, instead of saying, what do you want in five years? Oof. I moved away from that. I realized in that moment that if I didn't start planning my life, someone else would plan it for me. Then when I became a wedding photographer, that was my ticket out of the corporate world, right? But it was the dream for a while until it wasn't. And that was in a season of loss, which I'm sure we'll speak about um, in a personal level of growing our family. And I realized I don't want to be planning my life out around, or I don't want to be planning my family around my business, right? As a wedding photographer, I was literally giving myself these windows of times of like, here, you can get pregnant now. And life doesn't always work that way. And so I moved away from having to have a job that didn't allow for a human moment and didn't allow me to have the life first. And then, you know, as a podcaster, I like loved it, but I was really missing that like connection of like putting pen to paper and like really speaking about things other than just just marketing. My podcast 
podcast is the number one marketing podcast in the country, but I love marketing because it's led me to this life. And so the <laughs> book was the extension of the life. I don't want to just talk about marketing funnels. I want to talk about what they've unlocked in my life. Mm. And so it's really interesting when I have these moments because it's like, okay, it worked for a while and it wasn't a failure, but it's no longer working. And mm. I think a lot of times we have that like sunk sunk cost fallacy of like, well, I've already invested so much time. If I, if I stop now, it's going to be a waste. It's not a waste if you take it with you. Right. And so what's interesting to me is I think a lot of times women, when we recognize something is no longer working, we're so quick to abandon it. Right. Like we're like, mm. all right, just fresh start new beginning, which I love. But I think that we're missing this opportunity to take the gifts and the things and the traits and the ethics that we've learned from one thing and bring it to the next leverage it, use it as a launch pad. And so it's like figuring out how to make the things that are working continue to work for you while you're in that season of waiting so that it doesn't become a season of wasted. And I think that a lot mm. of listeners might be sitting in a season of waiting or they're wasting a season. And I think that there's this opportunity to say, okay, there are a few things that are good here that don't need to be thrown out. Like don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so I think that that's something that I've taken with me throughout it as I've identified these key moments of like, I don't want this any longer. Listen, listen, you're not the preacher on the podcast, but I'm about to get my praise hanky out, honey, because your alliteration is just turning me up. I'm saying, yes, girl, you better <laughs> preach. Dad proud, okay? That's it. That's it. So you could be the adopted Wattis daughter that That's hails great. from a preacher. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's hilarious. No, this is this is beautiful. This is absolutely, you're giving practical handles for people. I believe that people are going to walk in and not want to waste the season that they're in. So we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I think this will transition over into per personal beautifully. But um, with every rebirth, there is a death. Mm -hmm. And um, though marketing and marketing funnels and the podcast and the book have opened up a door for your life, there's also been a lot of things that you've had to mourn. Mm -hmm. And so can we, can we go just a little bit deeper with whatever you feel comfortable with, yeah. but as you're stepping into some beautiful things and new doors of opportunities and all this other stuff, you experience some sadness and some mourning. I'm a huge advocate that grieving leads to healing mm -hmm. and healing leads to the wholeness that all of us really desire. So with whatever you feel comfortable with, can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about some of the pain, some of the loss, some of the sadness or disappointment that you felt, even though so much of your life was going so beautifully? Yeah. So it's so interesting. So I've been with my husband. We met when we were 18 um, and we got married right out of college. We served pizza at our wedding. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> Pre-wedding photography days. And we, for much of our marriage in the first five years, we were like, we're never having children. We're not called to have children. We love life, the two of us. We kind of told our parents like, sorry, not sorry, but you're not getting grandkids from us. And all of a sudden, you know, we had spent so much time and energy and money trying not to have kids that when our heart started to shift and when we became aunts and uncles and started loving these kids and like seeing people really close to us go through this transformation that parenthood brings, we started to kind of look at each other like, wait a minute, maybe like no, never was just really a no, not now. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of entered this, this phase of our lives where we're like, well, maybe we do want to be parents. And wow, we didn't, we didn't think this was going to happen. And um, while I was a wedding photographer, I was basically giving myself this very short window of time. So I was like, I can get pregnant between January and March so that I can be <laughs> done with my first trimester before wedding season and I can give birth and then be back again for the next one. And that was our lives at that time. And, uh, as luck would have it, we did get pregnant and, um, we lost that baby around 10 weeks and mm -hmm. it was really weird, Bianca, because in that first loss, I just felt like there was a lot of meaning. Like I felt like the Lord has put this here. I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to like, you know, crush the stigma around miscarriage. I'm going to share it publicly. I'm going to do this. Like I'm going to, I'm going to give a message to this mess. And so a year rolls by, we try again. We're back in that window of time before wedding season, <laughs> get pregnant again. I'm like, this is the redemption song. Like, this is it. This is a story of how God is so good and this and everything. We go in, we hear a heartbeat. We're like, this is it. We go back, the same thing happened again. Mm. 
And I was crushed and I was so angry where it was like the first time around, I was like, okay, I can see how this is going to play out. I can, I can see how this will make an impact. The second time I was just straight up mad. Like this was not the story I was writing, right? Like I gave you this opportunity to tell a beautiful story and this is what you do with it. And I just remember being like so crushed because I was like, no, God, you're, you're messing up the plot. Like I, I laid this out for you and like you screwed up and I didn't want to show up. Like, I was like, how do you, how do you say like, God is good. And this happened again. Right? Like it just didn't make sense. And so we went through the second one and all of a sudden I like had this like moment because the same thing had happened again. It was 10 weeks again. It was the same. My body didn't recognize it. I had to go in for another surgery. It was just deja vu in the worst way possible. And I remember having this moment of like, something's wrong. Like something is really wrong. Like this shouldn't happen again. And I was Googling the chances and it was like less than 1% chance. Right. And you're like, you never want to be in that 1%. Yeah. And so it started this whole journey for me of like, I've got to fall back in love with this body because I hated my body. It failed to do this one thing that I wanted it to do. This one thing that I had believed it was made to do. And it was like, I resented it. And I was just carrying my grief with me everywhere. There's this line in the book of like, grief is meant to change us. And we're meant to like carry it. It's meant to be a passenger and not in the driver's seat. And for a long while, it was in the driver's seat of my life because I was just mad. And it took a lot of unpacking and, and it took a lot of honesty of like, well, now I'm just straight up scared to get pregnant because I know which way this can go, right? You don't get to be ignorantly blissful ever again when you've experienced something like that. Like miscarriage is a loss unlike any other because it's already ripping away your future before you get to experience it. And there's no other loss like that in your life. And so I took an entire year to fall back in love with myself, to get healthy, to understand and go into it a third time saying, I have done everything I possibly can. So there is no space left for me to blame myself if this doesn't go right. Mm. And for us, the third time was the charm. And I know for many, that's not the case and that they're reliving that story over and over again. And, you know, our journey into parenthood, it took three years. But now when I look at it, I can see that that waiting season was just as important as what it was that we were waiting for. And when I was in it, I didn't feel it, right? But I said, I'm not going to waste this season if I want to be a mom, I'm going to use this season to become the type of mother that shows up the way that I want to. And when I look at it now, if I would have had that first pregnancy to fruition, my life would be so different. I might still be gone every weekend shooting weddings, but mm -hmm. I recognize the pieces of my life that I could transform in the waiting season so that when that new beginning came along in the form of my little squirmy daughter, I had built something that supported the type of life that I imagined. I don't want to just gloss over what you so vulnerably shared because what I heard was what a lot of people, men and women wrestle with, which is mm -hmm. body shame and hatred. I heard, um, why am I broken? I heard, why didn't God come through? Yeah. I heard grief. And I don't want to gloss over that with it. Just thanking you for opening up a door of honesty that yeah. I think many will be able to walk through. So I, I don't, again, I don't want to jump from like the dark to light and then no. go to the Disney Let's narrative jump here. But, <laughs> but yeah, you have become a mom, not just once, but twice yeah. over. And this is a beautiful story of redemption and congratulations. Your life is stunning and beautiful. And yes, yeah, social media is only a glimpse into our real lives, but it is a beautiful life. Yeah. It is. You're living a very beautiful life. And uh, I want to talk about the now. Yeah. I, again, not glassing over the pain. I just want to also focus on how beautiful life is for you as a mother. So as um, an, any working mom out there or soon to be mom or a single person that's kind of wrestling like, a, like you were in the beginning, I don't yeah. want to have kids. I'm very happy with my life. As they step into a new role or contemplating a new role as mom, what's been the biggest learning that you've experienced in trying to do, I, I'm, I'm just to let you know, I'm gonna let you know right now that yeah. I'm not a fan when people say like balance. Yes, I just, same, same. Okay, great, great, great. <laughs> so please oh. don't say like, it's not a balanced yes. life. Like, no, 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 no. no. I don't know. We okay, call great. it What's the blend. Saying? 
So yes. I can't like, so if you actually study the origins of the word balance, a balance is meant to be a moment in time. So it is no wonder mm. that we hate that we're not in balance because it's not meant to be maintained. Balance is yes. not a state that should be maintained. So we should always feel out of balance in some way. And if you do, congratulations, you're a living, breathing human. That's amazing. Uh, and so I consider it the blend in my life where I'm like, and you brought this up earlier of like, if you want to like be a whole person, you've got to know your whole self. You've got to show up as your whole self. And for me, I'm fortunate enough to be able to blend, you know, career and motherhood and what this looks like. And so the challenging thing for me was feeling like I was half in on everything, right? I suddenly have something that feels more important than this work that I've poured my entire being into. And suddenly this work that once felt so important suddenly feels insignificant, which throws your identity off, right? Of like, wait, does this even matter? Why does this matter? And I still, and now coupled with an ADHD diagnosis, it makes sense that my brain feels like it's in a million places at once. And so when I became a mom, I would be sitting at my computer, but I'd be thinking about nursing or nap schedules, or did we get the right snacks? And then when I was with my kids, I'd be thinking, oh, I didn't send that email or gosh, I got to get back to that person or I didn't finish that review. And so that has been probably my greatest challenge in that. And one thing that I do as a practice, and I, I invite every listener to do this in your own life, is before I cross the threshold into any room, I take a moment and ask myself, what is my purpose in being here? Whether it is walking back into the house to read a book to my daughter or stepping into my office to do an interview, it's this one instant second of almost like a reset of like, this is why I'm here and this is what I'm going to be all in on. And I feel like when I take that moment to find that clarity, I feel less of that frenetic energy of I'm missing everything and I'm failing at it all. Okay. This is so, this is going to free people. I'm not even kidding you. I'm listening to this and I'm like, yes, fix, fix our life, snatch our edges, sister. Okay. Yes. This is what we need to do. So, uh, you do a 32 hour work week. Yes. Now I'm listening to that. Yeah. I have two teenagers, so yeah. it's it's different, different life stage. But but I'm also I'm a pastor. I'm a podcaster. I'm a writer. I travel for work. Um, I'm also a dreamer, and I want to create life with friends and family. So when I hear 32 hour work week, I'm thinking there's no way there is. But clearly there is. Yeah. So I would love. I mean, literally fix our lives. Ha walk us through a 32 hour work week, and then what was actually before you answer that? Yeah. Before we talk about the how, talk about the why. Yes. What in your life was so chaotic and so frenetic that you're like, I can't do this. I have to parse back and then tell us how. Yeah. So I am very different than your twin sister, Jasmine Star. <laughs> and I love that about us. Everyone is. Yeah. Everyone is. <laughs> so one thing that her and I often joke about is uh, in my life, nothing is an emergency. There are very few things in my life that are urgent. And I think that okay. part of our stress and part of this distaste for the lives that we're living is that feeling that everything is urgent and you're just putting out fires every day, right? And so I have learned how to anticipate needs, whether it is needs of my children or needs of my work life in advance so that nothing is urgent. There is no mm. reason somebody should call me on a Friday night. There is no reason why I should get a text on a Sunday about anything at work because none of it is urgent. And I think often we have to bring ourselves back and say, what is this work doing and who is it for? And unless there is a true emergency, it can wait. And mm. I think there is a lot of discomfort in stillness in our culture. I think that is the reason why we take our phones with us when we go to pee. We can't even be alone with ourselves for the 20 seconds it takes. <laughs> to go to the bathroom, right? We don't like to be alone with our thoughts because stillness will often bring in these questions of like, is this it? Like, is mm. this my life? Is this what I worked so hard for? Is this success? And for me, when I look at work, I'm very different in this way. I work to live instead of living to work. Mm. And I want my life to feel successful, not look successful. And you kind of brought this up at the beginning, but I think that a lot of people are living these lives that look amazing, but feel like crap. And mm. there is this great disconnect in what the world sees and how they present it versus how they feel at three in the morning when they're alone with their thoughts and the house is finally quiet. And so when I think about work, 
Like I love the work that I do because it gives me the life that I have. And I think that a lot of people in today's culture are living to work and their success is based on their output and their worthiness is found in their output and what they are putting out into the world instead of what they're putting into their own lives and into the next generation's lives and into our communities and the work that people will never see. I think that when you frame it like this, you're making it sound really easy. So let's speak to what people are thinking about why they can't. Yeah. Uh, You've been talking about this. You are implementing it. What are some of the reasons that you've heard the people like, oh no, I can't do that. I can't take Fridays off or everything is urgent. Yeah. What's the threshold for what is urgent? Yeah. I mean, can it be solved on a Monday (laughs) is a great question. (laughs) Um, One thing that I have really had to come back to is boundaries. So I think especially for women, we feel like boundaries are isolating, right? Like it's keeping things and people out of our lives. But in reality, boundaries are keeping us in our life. And we've all heard the analogy of like, put on your oxygen mask before you put it on others. And yet we look at boundaries as this enemy when really boundaries are there to keep us in what we say matters most. And let me just say, it is a privilege to be able to say, well, I'm just gonna take Fridays off to be with my family. Not everyone can do that. I recognize that and I get that. But at the same point too, are you creating urgency in your life where there could be ease? One question that I often ask myself is, what would this look like if it were easy? Because so often we are so perfection-based that we procrastinate or we overcomplicate so that we don't make progress. And then we berate ourselves because we're not making progress, but we're not showing up because we want to wait till we can tie it all up with a pretty bow and life doesn't work that way. And so what would this look like if I wanted to make an impact, but I wanted it to be easy? What would this look like if I wanted to mother, but I wanted it to be easy? What would this look like if I wanted to lead a team or lead a church or lead a family, but I wanted it to have a sense of ease? And a lot of times when you start to remove the excess, the urgency melts away. Way. The urgency are these things that we are putting on ourselves, deadlines that are arbitrary that no one else knows or cares about that don't actually exist, but we're just putting them on ourselves because we're following the pace of culture. Listen, listen. <laughs> okay, first of all, you're coming for me. You're reading my mail and you don't know this, but my word for this year was ease. I and love it. I don't live in that place. I don't live in that place, but all my 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 mantra, my mindset has been the words of Jesus come to me all who are heavy laden and burdened. I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so this is a reminder because I do think I do create frenetic mm-hmm. to me in this very displaced understanding. Frenetic feels like movement. Yes. And if we're, if it's not crazy, then we're not moving fast enough. Yes. And I'm just like, where did I get this mindset from? Yes. This is trash. Like yes. it's literal trash. So this is such a great reminder. Um, there's so much more I want to pick your brain on, but I do want to end with, we've talked about the, the, the professional we've spoken about the personal. I do want to speak about the physical yeah. because I just want to acknowledge and highlight as someone who has wrestled with my weight and my body image for such a long time. So much of what you have been transparent and honest on has been your body. You had said that you had learned to fall in love with your body mm-hmm. during the loss, um, of your first two born children. So what Oh man, see, I feel like this is a whole other podcast for another day, but we're going to stay here. We're going to stay here because it's we important. got this. Um, what were some of the things in this metamorphosis, in this new beginning of you, of you learning to lo- love your body that someone can hear and apply to their life now? Yeah. I think that a lot of times we treat our body like the enemy when really it's our best friend. Mm-hmm. And it's like your body has carried you through every day to this point. And One time I heard this example of like, if I were to give you, Bianca, one car and I said, you get this Mustang for the rest of your life, you better take good care of it. It's the only one I'm going to give you. You better believe you'd be getting your oil changed. You'd be cleaning out the McDonald's wrappers. You'd be taking care of that thing. But yet we don't treat our bodies in that way. We don't look at it in that way of like, this is the one thing I have. It's carried me through my worst days and it's carrying me through my best days. And it's interesting because literally for a decade, I have shared about my body. And I think that so many women don't even step up to the starting line because we've already disqualified ourselves from the race because of things that we have told ourselves about how we look, our weight, the size on the label of our clothes, um, our skin color. I mean, there's everything that we've written out in our own narratives of why this won't work for me. Why not me? And I think that so much of our lives are 
thought or so much of our thoughts are occupied with what we look like and not what we feel like. And it's crazy because I genuinely have loved myself at every stage. When I look back at photos, I'm like, that woman thought she was beautiful. And I never look back and I think, oh my gosh, like this, I, I have learned to love this shell, this meat suit around my soul <laughs> that has gotten me through all of this. And I really do think that in going through our miscarriages, I really had to learn how to befriend my body again and not punish it and not treat it as this enemy, but really acknowledge like this is the gift. And most recently, I've been on a massive health journey after having my second daughter where I was like, if I want to change the world, if I want to do really big things, I have to have energy. And if I don't have energy, I can't do any of this well. And so I went on this huge thing where I finally tethered myself to a why that was so much deeper than my weight, that was so much deeper than the way I looked, that kept me going and committed when in years past I couldn't stay committed because it was such a trivial reason of why I was doing anything. And so yeah. it's been this amazing journey. And I've just recognized that like when your health comes first, it, it feeds into every aspect of your life. And so for so many of us, I think we're telling ourselves this lie of like, you know, if I'm a better mom, my health can wait. If I'm a better entrepreneur, my health can wait. If I'm a better community member, my health can wait. And it's like, if your health comes first, all of those things will benefit from it. And it took me a long time to learn that. Well, we get to walk in your wake and learn from everything that you've learned. And what you are doing is you're cutting down the learning curve for us. You are giving us practical handles to hold on to. As we wrap up this podcast, Jenna, let me just say one more time. I'm so grateful for your time because you get, you have 32 hours in your work week and you gave us an hour. So thank you. As we wrap this up, uh, we take a look at the last decade of your life and so much that you have worked hard for and also so much that God has blessed you with. For somebody that is hearing this and feels like, I'm ready for that new beginning. What's one word of encouragement that you could send us off with? Yeah, I would say that it's never too late to begin and to not overcomplicate it. If you want to become a writer, write. If you want to start a podcast, speak. If you want to show up online, hit record. I think a lot of times we want to show that we have it all together, but I think that when we connect over our messes, the message is just amplified on a whole new level. And so if you can be the reason why someone can say either me too, or I thought I was the only one and I'm not alone, mm -hmm. that is your gift. And the only way you can do that is to let people under the hood like we went today and to show people the mess. Because I really do believe that your mess can become your message, but it only happens when you show up. I so appreciate you. I'm sending you so many blessings. Thank you for your honesty, your transparency, your vulnerability. And from one ADHD uh, survivor to another, I appreciate all your your words. Family, you can follow Jenna at Jenna Kutcher online as well as jennacutcher.com. Uh, but her book, How Are You Really, really goes deeper. And uh, I'm so appreciative of everything that she's putting out there. There's resources that are free and available on her podcast, as well as following her on social media. She's very open about the things that she's learning and she wants to share them. So if you enjoyed this podcast, will you tag at Jenna Kutcher with where you're listening to and what you're walking away with? We are nosy folk and we like to know. Thank you for listening to the podcast and we can't wait to join in next week.